this episode of Speed News, we talk about the 2012 25 Hours of Thunder Hill presented by the United States Air Force, the science of brake fluid, and how to get, and more importantly, keep a racing sponsor. Welcome to Speed News, the National Autosport Association's video news magazine, with hosts Rob Kreider and John Lindsay, joined by an ever-changing group of NASA members and staff. Speed News keeps you up to date on all of the happenings around the NASA motorsports world. Because at NASA, we drive harder. Hello, I'm your host, Rob Kreider, and welcome to the November issue of Speed News here on GoRacingTV.com. Alongside me, as always, is my host, John Lindsay. How you doing, John? Real good, Rob. Real good. And we got a guest host this month, Dave Royce. He is the regional director of the Great Lakes and Mid-Atlantic Divisions over there in the East Coast. How'd you survive the storm up there? Well, we were a little far west for the storm, but it is getting cold. We had a 40 degree drop in temperature last night, but we're ready to go. Ooh, Ooh that's rough. <laughs> well, speaking of cold, we're gonna talk this uh, segment about the 25 hours of Thunder Hill, where it is generally very, very cold and miserable and uh, but we all go back to it every year for some reason. This is actually the 10th anniversary of the 25 hours presented by the United States Air Force. It's at the famed Thunder Hill in Willows, California. Now, Dave, you've actually been to that race and rumor has it you won the first ever 10 years ago overall uh, event. Well, when you say you, what you mean is I was one of the drivers on the massive team that's able to pull off an actual overall win at, a, at such a fantastic race. But we were, we were there in a, uh, a 996 GT3 Cup car, and I think there were six drivers on the team, some very well-named drivers, and then me tucked into the bottom of that list. And yeah, after 12 hours, um, we were still neck and neck. After 25 hours, you know, there were cars on the same lap, knocking it out for that, uh, that final lap victory for an overall. That's incredible to have a race that long, the longest road race really in North America, and have cars still on the same lap. It's happened year after year. Uh, it's incredible. Now, the last three years, Mercer Motorsports has taken a portion. They've won overall three years in a row. Rumor has it they are not showing up this year. So really, it's a wide open field. Uh, it's anybody's game. What do you think, John? Who's looking good this year for the 25? Well, I tell you what, there's a lot of really strong teams that are, uh, that are coming in. I just saw that uh, the, uh, I believe it's a Davidson Racing entry. They're running a Norma. Uh, I think they have Randy Popest on the, on the driver's list there. They're looking good. You know, that's going to be a spec racer type car they're always uh well not spec racer but a uh you know a formula type car uh with the small uh you know lightweight and then some good horsepower so those are always very fast and that's a great driver lineup that they have but like you said it's really anybody's field uh traditionally anybody who runs a porsche gt3 cup car has a good shot at it those cars are dead reliable very fast uh you know anyone that can get down in the uh 140 uh, something range lap time is usually uh, got a pretty good shot, but the key is really consistency, uh, the car not braking, and really not getting into any incidents where you're in the Dutch with the race directors. And Dave, I think you're running in that top ES class again, aren't you? Yeah, I've joined the, the Boothman Racing Team, and they have a unique car for running a 25 hour. It's a highly modified Factory 5. And if you paired it up to another regional NASA class for sprint racing, it would be an ST1 in its prep. So it's a very fast factory five car and I'm looking forward to, to doing that. But I think that, you know, they've been doing this for a few years with that car and the reliability should be there. Uh, no question about it. The factory five cars have been really reliable. They've had numerous in all the years, I think the 25, the factory five cars showed up and run. Uh, there's six classes this year, uh, as normally is going to be the ESR, which is the prototypes, ES, which is a super fast class, which generally wins this event, uh, E0, E1, E2, and E3, but the real field, the biggest field right now is going to be E3, and that has been won almost every year by a Miata. Uh, what do you think, John? Are going to have another Miata on the podium in E3? Well, there's some crazy guys that are running Nissan Sentras in that class, from what I understand. <laughs> But yeah, the Miatas are always really strong. We've got Emilio Cervantes and his team coming back. Uh, they had the great result at Mid-Ohio with the Nationals, and they're a strong, strong team. But I will be visiting all of you. I am the chief scrutineer for the event, so I will be sitting there in the, uh, in the pits waiting for everyone to come in and make sure everybody won it fair and legal style. But Rob, uh, I wish you good luck, and Dave too. Both of you guys are running in the event. Rob, I think you're doing E3, and Dave and ES, so... 
your, uh, your host from the video program here will be all at the 25 Hours of Thunder Hill in different capacities. Yes, yeah, so John, how much money do I got to give you to put a little uh, banana in the tailpipe of some Miatas as they go through the scrutineering? Well, it's all negotiable, and you know that I'm easily bribed with uh, both liquor and cash, so as much <laughs> as you can bring of either can really guarantee a good finish for you. I, I'm easily bought, just like uh, good. many of the, say, politicians and other folks in this country, I am not above being completely corrupted by you. Both of you, both of you. I'm not going to limit myself. Anybody who's there, visit the tech trailer. And we will be accepting bakshish all night and all uh, all day long for 25 hours. <laughs> those are those are really good things to know because I have some 21 year old scotch with your name on it. <laughs> well done, Dave. I think Dave's going to look real well through scrutineering. Uh, Kreider racing with their two Nissan Sentras. Uh, we're going to do the best we can. We're kind of racing ourselves aside from the Miatas. We got to survive the race. I think that most teams that go out there and really try to race other cars are probably missing the point of that race. Uh, you're racing the clock. You're racing uh, your lower ball joint. You're racing your transmission. All those things have to survive 25 hours. You know, you can't win the race if you're in the pits uh, doing a motor swap. So, you know, for us, uh, I don't pay a whole lot of attention to what other teams are doing. Uh, I'm just trying to stay out of their way. Uh, I've been wrecked at the 25 hour before at three o'clock in the morning, which was no fun uh, by an ESR car. Not good times. Um, that's why I'm bringing two cars this time. <laughs> double the chances to either have a great weekend or double the chances to have a terrible weekend. But uh, we're trying to have the best chance we have with uh, the backup car, which I'm right now I'm hemorrhaging cash on correctly. The car that was just like, ah, let's just bring this along. Uh, my credit card is smoking right now with overnight charges for parts. So what are you going to do? <laughs> I think Dave has it right, man. Arrive and drive is the way to go. Well, you know, there's always a lot of prep to go. And, and you know, what I can do is encourage folks at the regional levels who want to do the 25 hour, you know, to get in the regional level has endurance racing between one and a half to three hours and four hours and six hours. A lot of the regions are running the endurance racing and a lot of drivers use these for prep. And if you really think about it, most of the teams have multiple drivers, which means there's always going to be some folks who show up and drive uh, those cars. Not everybody preps on all the cars, but at the regional level, there's a lot of endurance racing to prep your car, to prep your team, to prep your drivers for running more than 40 minutes in a sprint race. There's a big difference between 40 and an hour and a half or 40 and two hours or 40 and three hour stints. And to really prep yourself mentally and physically is a little bit more challenging you know, than you think it is. You go from, you know, like our HPD program, you go from shorter, shorter programs up to the high intensity of racing. And, and then you do the endurance racing, which, the, which is the next level. But endurance racing is more than just about the driving and long distances. It's really about the camaraderie that you bring together. You got these guys. This is what happens most of the time, Rob, and you'll probably attest to this, is that you've been racing door to door in the sprint races all year long with these guys. And all of a sudden, you're on the same team. There's a completely different dynamic. And you now are rooting for the same team in the same car. I can't tell you how much fun it is to be in an endurance team and everybody shooting for the same goal as opposed to all year long doing the sprint race thing where it's a very isolated program. I couldn't agree more. In fact, uh, that's, I think, where a lot of the learning comes from in driving. I mean, we all think we're the pretty much the fastest thing that ever touched a car before, but uh, go and race a 25 hour, put a couple of hot shoes in your car and you find out you have a lot to learn. And uh, what a great opportunity to uh, look at telemetry and uh, decide like, oh, wow, I'm really wussing out, you know, over the bypass where, uh, you know, I got uh, Brian Highcotter from Nissan Motorsports. He's running with us. We have Dave Schatz, National Championships. You know, these guys are fast. I'm just trying to keep the car on the track so they can go fast later for me. Yeah, I'm with you on that. I'll tell you, there's one. Let me tell you a little quick story about the 25 hour we did uh, the first time it was run. We had, I think there was something on the order of uh, seven months of planning into this with the two Stuttgart Performance uh, Porsches that were running. And it all came down to the very first lap out on the grid. You know, I've got all the cars out on there ready to go. Everybody's walking around the cars. The national anthem goes. Time to get the cars out on the first lap. And it starts raining and nobody is on reins. <laughs> Seven months worth of planning, and the entire strategy is out the window on the very first lap. Very first lap, cars in for rains. Talk about fuel strategy and everything else out the window. Uh, that's that's the way endurance racing is. So you got to be on your game, ready to react and improve your position, no matter what what is thrown at you. And I think that's the the real fun about it. Well, you grab a good point. Tires. That reminds me that Toyo Tires is going to do a deal where if you buy Toyo Tires for the twenty five hours. Uh, they are going to do hospitality for you. They're going to have food for all your crew. They're going to give you free mounting and balancing. 
Plus they have the new RR tire, which is great for classes like E3, E2. So uh, definitely they're gonna have some rain, some full tread uh, RA1s. So honestly, if uh, you haven't made a tire decision yet and some teams haven't even decided if they're going to this event yet, like, like some guys like to do it last minute, uh, definitely talk to Mark Sonsenbacher at Toyo. Uh, he's put Steve here heading this whole thing together with uh, AIM tires at Thunder Hill. And uh, what a great opportunity to feed your guys and get free mounting and balancing. And plus you win the race, you get uh, contingency money from Toyo as well. So definitely look for that as an opportunity for teams at this year's 25 hours of Thunder Hill, the 10th anniversary presented by the United States Air Force. That finishes up this segment. We're gonna come back and talk about some brake fluid. State your desires. Speed, adrenaline, competition. Calculating result in three, two, one. The National Auto Source Association. Start here. Welcome back to Speed News. You know, one of the great things about racing is going as fast as you can, but uh, if you've raced enough, you realize that going fast is great and more horsepower is great, but you definitely need to probably slow down as well. And uh, that's where brakes come into play. And any road racer will tell you that brakes are as important as horsepower or suspension, in my opinion, because uh, the woe pedal definitely keeps you out of trouble. And so, uh, John, what's your experience? I think you've had some experience uh, going off the track. Uh, how are your brakes working for you there? Uh, yeah, you know, Rob, a, a great story is I was at uh, California Speedway many years ago with my little Nissan Sentra, and my Sentra buddies had told me the hot setup was to switch over to the NX2000 rotors that are a little bigger, but they neglected to tell me that I was going to have to change the pads uh, in order to match that rotor size. So I went ahead and put everything in, and gee, the brakes are working great and not fading as much, and I went down into a corner after a restart and there was this funny sound, this little pong, and all of a sudden the pedal went straight to the floor. I was in the back section of the course there. There's a, a short back straight that leads into a chicane and I had 20 cars in my gun sights going down in there and I managed to avoid all of them. This is a car that I'd left the emergency brake in and by God, this was an emergency. So <laughs> I pulled the emergency brake up, locked the rear wheels up and slid to a stop right in front of the tow truck. And that was a, a good lesson and really, and, and later on one of the quarter marshals came over and handed me my brake pad, which had flown over his head and <laughs> gone, you know, sailing out of the, the caliper and through the wheel spokes when the, uh, the pad had a shoulder cut in it and then the, the rotor caught that and flung it out of the caliper. So again, uh, brakes, wow, really important. I've had lots of experience with uh, Brakes, you know, not getting the fluid right. This article was about fluid, which was really, really a, an important part of it. If you have bad brake fluid, you're going to have a really bad day. Uh, it's something that is an easy thing to check and to make sure you have fresh fluid. And it is so critical because you boil that fluid, you've got a soft brake pedal, and then you're going to have to try to manage it and, and cool the brakes back down. If you don't have the right ducting, if you are in a really tight battle and all of a sudden you have no brakes, you're pretty much done. So the article was great because it talks about the different kinds of brake fluids, how to maintain things. I really like the tip on writing the, uh, the date that you open the can on the can itself, when you bought it, when you opened it. Because a lot of times, as, as it said in the article, that you can have just dozens of bottles of brake fluid laying around. You go, huh, well, this might be fresh, this might be fresh. You put in the wrong one, it's full of water, and you lose 50, 60, 70 degrees of boiling point. And all of a sudden, that great super duper fluid that you bought is total crap. So a really important article, I think, for anyone, HPD, Racer, uh, Rally, Autocross, whoever to read, and just such an easy way to ensure safety and also maximum performance from your car, and really cheap to do, too. Now, the article you're referring to is in the November uh, issue of Speed News, which was an article where uh, the engineer from Torque Racing Brake Fluid, Michael, he was interviewed and he talked, I mean, he knew more about brake fluid than uh, I ever knew and ever wanted to know, but actually had a very, very interesting insight on the different uh, ways that these fluids have to meet the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards and how they can work with them to make them really good racing brake fluids. And uh, so now, Dave, you had a lot of work. I know you worked for Ibox Springs for a while. I'm sure you guys did some brake stuff. You got any uh, brake fluid horror stories? 
Well, you know, it's interesting about breaks and, and more people will see this now that data acquisition is far more popular than it uh, used to be and a lot cheaper to get into, um, is that when you look at your data graphs, your acceleration and your deceleration graphs, you quickly realize that the more work being done, in other words, moving that vehicle, that mass, fast and slow, more work is done on the brake pedal than the gas pedal. So if you don't think brakes are important, just look at that data acquisition and see how vertical that line is, how quickly you're getting that car stopped versus how you accelerate, and you'll realize you're doing a lot more work under the brake pedal. And besides, if you look at any good racing, most of your passes are done under, under braking. So uh, I think brakes are pretty important. Now, one of the things we learned in the article there was you know, we talked about how these brake fluids do absorb moisture and that stuff is in the atmosphere. It is in your brake system. You can do all the things in the world. There's always going to be moisture in your brake system. And uh, the guys from Torque Racing Brake Fluid talked about, you know, really what's the best time to recycle that whole fluid. They recommend it every 12 months. Uh, that's why we talked about um, once you open that bottle, you're going to allow moisture into that bottle. That's why we put that label on there that shows it. Hey, this is when I bought it. This is when it actually was opened. Because I've certainly been in that same situation where I got a trailer full of uh, bottles of fluid. Like, which one are we going to use now? And uh, so we try to avoid that with that little tip. Uh, one of the things we talked about was the, you know, the boiling point. And there is a dry boiling point and a wet boiling point, what that all means. And really what that comes down to is dry boiling point is the boiling point when it comes right out of the factory ready to go. A wet boiling point is considered after it's had some time with exposure to the atmosphere. And that doesn't mean just a can sitting out open on your bench. It means if you put it in your car, you've already exposed to the atmosphere. It's just not a sealed system. And uh, so we have a chart in that magazine that shows basically the highest one. The highest one we tested was going to be the torque racing brake fluid. They're actually based here in the United States up in uh, at Sonoma Raceway. And that's actually the only brake fluid that's made in America right now that uh, works out pretty good. So it's probably pretty interesting stuff. I certainly learned a lot and how important it is. I know I've tested stuff and uh, we get some kind of pedal loss, you know, after some time. Really, that comes down to your fluid doesn't really circulate in your system. So the fluid that's in your brake caliper is the same fluid that's going to be in there. It's not recycling up into the actual uh, booster. You know, uh, it's actually just sitting there getting hot and cold, hot and cold. And so sometimes that fluid breaks down. Um, so that's why a lot of teams will bleed off just a few inches of line after every session. Because towards the end of the session, they get a little bit of a softer pedal. But uh, we found with the torque stuff... It's not just a high boiling point. Actually, that stuff never really gave it up. You know, uh, the stuff in the actual caliper didn't um, didn't start to go away. And so we actually went 25 hours without bleeding the brakes one time. We actually ran, I think, four sets of Carbotech brake pads and never had to bleed the brakes once. So that's pretty impressive in my book because I've definitely had fluids in the past that we started getting a soft pedal and had to deal with that. And, you know, during the 25 hour, which we talked about earlier, you know, brake pad changes are going to happen. I don't know anybody who's getting through that race on one set. And uh, so if you can avoid having to bleed your brakes, that makes a quicker pit stop and, you know, everything is for the better. Uh, Dave, how many brake pads you guys go through? <laughs> well, I guess I'd have to talk to the crew chief or the car chief about that. My job was to push the pedals and turn the steering wheel. But uh, we'll, yeah. <laughs> we'll go through a lot of those things. You know, one of the things about from a driver perspective, which is really what I like to, to focus on, is when you have a brake issue, you go down to that, you go into that threshold braking mode and something isn't quite right you know instantly something is not quite right. And so you go into the next corner and you hit it again, but your confidence level starting to wane a little bit. So brake, brake fluid and brake temperatures and all the things are important. Getting those brake systems, uh, uh, such as the article explains, is to get those things up and top running will actually allow you to produce better lap times, not from the performance specifically, but from the driver confidence specific. Anybody ever grab the left foot brake, tap that brake pedal down just to make sure it's there before you go into that real fast corner? That's a confidence issue in your brakes. And if you don't have that, you're not going to be fast. I couldn't agree more. John, how about you? You had any uh, situations with your Porsche where uh, brake pedal went to the floor? Well, not with the, uh, not with the two current Super Beetles. They seem to be uh, okay with brakes. <laughs> uh, I did do an autocross where I managed to boil the bejesus out of the, uh, the brakes in the Targa, but that was just because I was just all over the course totally ham-fisted. It was uh, a course with my, uh, an autocross with my local chapter of the, uh, the Porsche Club, Sacramento Valley, and we were out at uh, Sears Point, and I just could not get together that weekend. And sure enough, I came into one of the final corners, and like Dave said, you know, it was a confidence issue. I came into one of those corners, and the pedal just went all kinds of mushy. And of course, I got way out of shape and mowed down about 20 cones. Uh, but the rest of the day, I, I really didn't have my mojo because I was always thinking, oh, geez, you know, I'd driven the car to the track, so I didn't have any way to bleed the brakes or 
do anything, but that was always kind of in the back of my head and it really did hurt my times, uh, aside from the obvious lack of skill, the, uh, <laughs> the confidence issue is huge. So again, it's a, it's a total package where you're looking for having the car completely reliable. That way you're, you know, you're getting your best braking every time. So again, one of those little demon tweaks that you can do and really not much effort, not much expense, but very high reward when you get your fluid dialed in as part of it. Sorry about that. John, there's, uh, there's one element of this that uh, I think it's important, and that's that transition from HPD to time trials and for competition racing because, you know, the street, they talk, the article talks about the various and fluids, but a lot of people come out to the HPD or even do time trials and they have, you know, good brake pads and they've got the sticky tires, but they really didn't mess with the fluid too much. And, you know, people, as they move through the, the system, the HPD ladder system up into racing or time trials, they really got to focus on that brake fluid and make sure you're moving everything up in a systematic uh, format. Absolutely. You know, it's one of the easiest things to change. I mean, changing brake fluid is just not difficult and it's not that expensive. So really, if you guys are transitioning up the ladder from HPD to racing, you really got to change that brake pad. Great tip, Dave. Thank you very much. All right. That takes the end of this segment. We come back, we're going to talk about sponsorships, how to get them and how to keep them here on Speed News. Welcome to another episode of Racing No Filter. Joining me in sunny California, Bill Wood, and down in sunny Florida, Peter Keen. We're going to take a look at some of the products HPD has created for the 2012 Honda Civic. And specifically, we're going to show you how to install an adjustable sway bar. Until then, folks out there, you take care. Welcome back to Speed News. Another article we saw in the November issue of Speed News Magazine was how to get sponsors and how to keep them. And really it was a fantastically written article, covered a lot of great points. And uh, you know, for me personally, I hate to pay for stuff. So I like to get as much free stuff as I can. But what the article really talked about was nothing's really free. And uh, drivers who think that they're just gonna slap one sticker on their car and get uh, free oil from Royal, uh, Royal Purple for the rest of their lives, uh, they're kidding themselves. So uh, John, uh, what's your experience with uh, sponsors and what they're looking for? What do you remember from the article? I tell you, Rob, the article was right on because it really talked about the importance of social media, getting the word out. And the main thing you have to do with a sponsor is if you want them to give you $500 of something or 500 bucks in cash, you have to show them how you're going to provide that value back. And that really is something key. I had a, a great relationship for years with Maximum Motorsports, Chuck Schweinock and his crew down in San Luis Obispo. And they helped me with parts. They helped me with, uh, with crewing on the car for the weekends. But the key thing was I had to tell them and show them with my commitment how I was really going to help them sell more parts for Mustangs. And in this case, we did because we had a good team. It was myself and Ryan Flaherty. And we went out and did really well. And also importantly, it talked in the article about being available to talk to people about the products and really help the, the sponsor try to sell more of whatever it is they're selling. So it was a great article and it really talked about being professional. It's not just handing them, a, you know, taking a small Word document and sending it out to 30 guys, uh, very generic, very just kind of shotgun approach. You really have to care and you have to put your all into it. Especially now, there's not a lot of money floating around like there was, say, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and people really want to see the value for that. So it was a great article. I think everybody in our NASA programs can obtain sponsorship at some level. Don't think that you have to go to huge corporate sponsors or even sponsors in the motor motorsports world. You can go to the corner deli, the pizza joint, uh, you know, maybe Freddie's house of photos and Something like that, where you're always looking for some way where you can say, look, I can come in and I race in this program. All these people are going to see this car. Hopefully, if I, if I do well, I'm going to be in Speed News. It goes out to all these folks every month and really show them how you're going to do value. Bring your car out, do special events for them, something where they can really see a value in it. So a great article, great guidelines, and really something that I think all of our racers can achieve, especially in this age where it's so easy to get the word out with all the different channels, with your Facebook, your Twitter, uh, making your own web page. It's not that hard. Even I can do it. You can go to GoDaddy and get your own web page up and put neat photos up, update it every couple of weeks, keep the excitement going. 
So it's something that's easily attainable for all of our guys. This is a great article. So use it as a touchstone and hopefully you can go out and knock down some sponsors to help you with your racing budget for the year. Now, Dave, you've worked, uh, I'm sure, as a driver and as, as your previous employment with IBOC, I'm sure you saw the sponsorship thing kind of happening or not working or working. So what have you seen in that regard to sponsorship? Well, from a couple of different perspectives, I'll talk about the, you know, as a, as a working with a company who manufactured parts such as iBox Springs, they, they would get proposals every week, dozens, sometimes hundreds in a month from different teams from all the way from NASCAR, if I can say that on this show, all the way of from course. NASCAR, all the way down <laughs> to... <laughs> I've never heard of that. What's that? An, yeah, exactly. All the way down to autocross, they would get proposals. So, you know, when you think of um, sending out a proposal, you really have to think about the competition, not just on the track, but your proposals there, whether it's a, a social media proposal, whether it's a DVD, whether it's a video of you, whatever your mechanism is for communicating to a sponsor that you have a desire to have their product and, you know, hopefully maybe a little bit of cash, uh, you're competing with a lot of people. So you have to put a lot of effort into doing sponsorship and you have to be on. There's one element that John hit on oh, just about every issue with sponsors except for one, and that's follow-up. You know, a lot of racers, they get the sponsorship. Oh, I got my springs or I got my engine or whatever that com particular component is. That's great because that's a product. Getting cash from sponsors is a little bit tougher, uh, but you have to show the return, the ROI. What is the, why would somebody give you something? Uh, they, they have lots of opportunity to do that. The competition is fierce. You know, the professionally produced DVDs down to the, you know, the business card because you had a social en encounter with a sponsor and, you know, either one of those can work just fine. Once you click, you click and you've got, you know, you've got some inroads. And uh, we, we were very successful at getting sponsorship to run programs over the years. And the, what it was was follow-up, the newsletter afterwards, that you've got to tell the sponsors what you've achieved for them. They're not, they're not <laughs> as much as you'd like to believe, they're not really going out there looking for what you did for them. They want you to tell them what you did for them. Hey, thanks for those. Thanks for those three stickers on the car from Royal Purple. I got my case of oil. I really like that. Here's what I did for you. I placed second. I placed third. I placed first. I won this championship. I was at these three car shows. You know, you got to really come full circle with that and really show the sponsorships what you've done for them. That is what most people don't take the time to do. And those are the people who actually get more sponsorships the next year. I know some very, very good drivers who can't find sponsorship because it's not their forte. They're drivers, they're not marketers, that's understandable, but there's lots of tools on the web, as John pointed out, to create yourself a very professional looking website and to point people towards. Uh, so follow up, follow up, follow up is gonna be a key to keeping that sponsorship for the future. Now we're not saying that you have to walk around covered in stickers all the time with uh, you know, whenever you start a sentence, you say, oh, well, yeah, I tell you what, that Budweiser uh, Master Craft Tool uh, Monte Carlo is running real good today <laughs> or something like that. But as Dave said, the follow up is the key and being a, presenting a professional image and you can even get the kid down the street if you're not web savvy to come up with a nice website for you. But professional image, follow up and really demonstrating that ROI are the key things here. The one thing that John I'll touch on is the is how do you want to be portrayed on uh, you know on YouTube? I guess that's the answer. You know when you're when you're out there doing something, and I won't mention any Rob's names um, about you know having a, a particular personality. You know maybe on a, you know in a paddock or something about something you're passionate about. But you you're you're basically once you have a sponsor, you're now representing that particular company and all of your behavior. So keep that in mind as well. Everything is being video recorded. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, I don't even know what you're talking about. But anyways, I want to tell you that Royal Purple really does a great job with their fluid and Light Force Lights does a great job with their lights. And uh, Iowa Port Racing is a great place to get stuff, torque brake fluid, Toyo tires. You know, I can, I can list a million sponsors, obviously, you guys know. Uh, but, you know, one of the great things, uh, Dave, I think you had a really, really good point there. I agree with you 100%. And what that is, is the follow-up. And I've seen a lot of people make the mistake. It's one of the things I learned to do early on was that, you know, once we got the uh, product and that was great, we did the event. But the week after the race, when all my friends were done, I had a lot of work to do. And that was going to be a business letter. It was going to be a CD with photographs. It was going to be internet links. It was going to be a t-shirt with their logo on it. Uh, maybe uh, an image of a large banner with everybody's logos on it, making sure they get photographs of the car. 
you've got to provide that stuff back to the sponsor or you're never going to see another case of oil again. And that's the thing I've seen a lot of teams, just like you mentioned, make a mistake on. So when the race is over, honestly, it's just beginning. There's a lot of work to still be done. Um, when you're looking for different jobs to have, if you've got a uh, significant other that uh, isn't very good at turning wrenches, well, hey, maybe they're good at making a website. Maybe they're good at uh, graphic design. Uh, get some t-shirts printed up. Make sure that you hand those out with the logos on them. Make sure the logos are correct. I had mis problems with uh, screen printers where you know, the logo was screwed up and I'm handing a sponsor a t-shirt that their, their logo's missing a letter, whatever. So that's pretty embarrassing. Um, you don't want to do things like that. You're definitely not going to get any more Toyo tires if you pronounce it, you know, Koyo tires, you know, on the shirt or something. So, uh, something to definitely look forward to. So sponsorships are good because, Hey, who wants to pay for stuff? But the fact of the matter is I've had a lot of sponsors that I would have been more, it would have been easier for me to just buy the product because I spent probably more time trying to uh, give them back what they gave to me, which is my responsibility to do that. But it's trying to build a long-term relationship so you can get more in the future and have a great working relationship with different companies. And, uh, I agree hundred percent. You gotta be a walking billboard, but, uh, being the right guy on YouTube is uh, also a good idea. Thank you, Dave, for that advice. <laughs> all right. It's all good. All right. So speaking of sponsors, we have a GoPro move of the month here. And, uh, this episode is, uh, got a driver, uh, named AJ Gracie, and he actually owns, um, performance in frame tuning, who does a lot of work on my car. Surprisingly. What a shock. How did this all come together? What's a big coincidence? Wow. John, why don't you take us through the uh, segment? <laughs> All right, Rob. Well, we, we will go to our NASA Vision 6000 uh, consoles here. Now, this takes place at uh, the infamous Turn 2 at Sears Point, Sonoma Raceway. I, I always get it wrong. Uh, one of my favorite tracks, but I could just never get the name right. And Turn 2 is really a, kind of has a, a good pucker factor because you go up the hill in Turn 1, you're usually flat out. And Turn 2 is an <laughs> off-camber right-hander. And I have seen more cars get pitched off there than I can count. So let's go ahead and roll the footage and we'll look at AJ here. So right now he is coming up and approaching turn two. Hit it up under the bridge there and you can see that, oh my gosh, whoa, whoa. the lift's go. <laughs> hey now, Scandinavian flick. That's a lot of elbows. Not, yeah, very, <laughs> very fast hands, nice recovery. Uh, it was not a drifting event, it was a USTCC road raced, uh, but he did do a nice Dorifto, so style points there. Didn't have to clutch kick or use the e-brake or anything. He had some help with some fine quality oil on the track there. Might have been royal purple, we don't know. Uh, but just look at those sponsors in there. <laughs> but a nice save by AJ I'm pretty there. sure it was royal purple, yes. Yeah, yeah. He, he wouldn't have slid like that if it was anything else. It's the best possible lubricant for right. you know, trying to get such a great lubrication. You could tell Definitely, definitely royal purple because it has such a great, you know, quick lubrication there. You know, no other fluid does that. Uh, so I, I, I think I saw the royal, I saw the purple glistening off the racetrack as he was going up the hill there. <laughs> there, there are so many inappropriate <laughs> places we could go with this, but we just won't. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Hey now. Well, listen, uh, yeah, I talked to AJ about that. He was definitely, as Dave mentioned, a lot of elbows and fingers and that steering wheel. He actually went lock. I think he gave uh, Vaughn Gittin Jr. a run for his money. I think Vaughn needs to look uh, for uh, a replacement. And that's a front-wheel drive car that he drifted up that hill like that. So pretty impressive. Uh, well done, AJ, for uh, drifting up turn two like that, lock to lock and not crashing. So very impressive. And uh, that pretty much wraps it up here for our uh, episode of Speed News. For you guys that are coming up in December at 25 Hours Thunder Hill, uh, come see John or Dave or I. And if you come to the Cry Racing Pits, there will be the Sailor Jerry Spice Rum Girl uh, next to the Sailor Jerry uh, Airstream trailer. And we'll have some Sailor Jerry there. Nobody can drink it, of course, uh, until the race is over. But uh, come on by. Uh, uh, rumor is uh, she's a very nice lady, John. I think you're going to like to meet her. <laughs> that, that will be epic, Rob. Just epic. <laughs> Yeah, I put that together just recently, so it's going to be a good time. So, Arr, so Sailor Jerry's Sailor, the good stuff. Arr, the Sailor Jerry. <laughs> Arr. <laughs> All right. That ends our episode on Speed News. If you want your uh, segment, uh, send it to Speed News uh, at uh, nasaproracing.com, and we'll put it on the show. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Dave. Uh, everyone, good luck at the 25-hour. Bring your sweatshirts and jackets and gloves and hand warmers. It's going to be cold. Don't and forget uh, your we'll see you guys. And your raincoat and your rain tires from <laughs> Toyota Tires. <laughs> very good. All right, guys, we'll see you. Thank you very much. See you next month here on GoRacingTV.com. <laughs>